Today I want to talk a little bit about intermolecular forces. So with solutions, we're talking about how molecules mix together or why they don't mix together, why they don't form solutions. And the key to this, the heart of all of the reasons for why molecules mix together or don't are called intermolecular forces or we abbreviate them as IMFs, intermolecular forces. So inter means between, molecular obviously is referring to molecules. This could be between atoms as well, but we can kind of go with intermolecular forces. And forces here just means that there is an attraction sometimes between molecules, and we'll talk about the reason why. So these intermolecular forces are attraction between molecules, and the attraction is caused by the attraction between opposite charges. So positive and negative. If we have a positively charged thing on one side and a negatively charged thing on another side, then there's gonna be an attraction between these two things. And this attraction causes a stickiness, this is usually the way that they talk about it, stickiness between molecules. So fundamentally, anything that causes some sort of charge discrepancy within a molecule, a positive on one and a negative on the other, is gonna allow for the possibility that the two molecules will be attracted to each other. And there will be this force of attraction that causes them to stick together and ultimately to mix together. And so I wanna talk about these IMFs. And there are three major intermolecular forces. The first one is called dipole-dipole. Okay, dipole-dipole. So dipole-dipole in intermolecular forces refer to polar molecules. Remember polar bonds? These are both gonna be polar molecules. So polar molecules have polar bonds. Remember that polar bonds are an unequal sharing of electrons. Polar bears don't like to share. So we have a covalent bond. It's definitely sharing electrons, but one is pulling on those electrons more than the other. And that's because of the differential in the electronegativities between the two elements. Okay, so the difference in electronegativities allows for an unequal sharing of the electrons, which means that the bond is polar. The example that we gave before was in the molecule HCl, which is hydrochloric acid or hydrogen chloride. And we said that if we look at the Pauling electronegativity scale, which we have right here, then hydrogen is 2.1 on the Pauling electronegativity scale and chlorine is 3.0. So when I take the difference between my 3.0 and my 2.1, then I get a difference of 0.9, which is in between 0.4 and 1.7. So that means that this is a polar bond. And because there's an unequal sharing of electrons between that hydrogen and chlorine, and that chlorine is the more electronegative element, then if we're visualizing the electrons around this molecule as a cloud, then the electrons are much more going to be hanging out with the chlorine, that's the more electronegative element, than the hydrogen. So I have more electrons on this side, which I'm representing with my more bulbous cloud. It's not an equal sharing. 
and we have fewer electrons over here. So if we have more electrons on one side, that means we have more negative charge over here. And so we have this extra negative charge, but it's not a complete transfer of electrons. Remember, ionic bonds completely transfer electrons from one element to another. This is a non-metal with a non-metal, so it's just an unequal sharing. Still sharing, but there's a discrepancy. So on this side, we say that there's this slight delta negative charge or a partial negative charge. And this is a lowercase Greek delta, in case you can't see my chicken scratch. And because there's fewer electrons over here, so we have basically more negative charge over here, and because there's fewer negative charges over here, that makes this side slightly positive. So we have a slight partial positive charge on this end of my bond, on this end of my molecule. If I have a molecule that is positive on one side and negative on the other, when we're sharing electrons like this, then the molecule itself is polar. So it's not just that it's polar bonds, but it's their location within the molecule. So it's easier to see when you'll ha only have one bond, but it gets a little more complicated when we look at other types of bonds. So let's look at water, for instance. Water we know is H2O. And we know that the oxygen has two lone pairs and two places that it can make bonds. So it can share an electron here with this hydrogen. It can share an electron here with this hydrogen. Now my oxygen has a full octet. And I can show that I have these lone pairs here with my kind of Mickey Mouse ears, right? So I have four electron pairs around a central atom, which means that I have tetrahedral Vesper geometry. And so when I draw this like a tetrahedron, I have basically a structure that gives me my bent molecule. So water, we say, is bent. And if I look at just one of these bonds, so I take one of these bonds out of context and just look at the difference between oxygen and hydrogen, I have to break out my Pauling electronegativity scale again. So we already said that hydrogen is 2.1. And if I look up oxygen here, oxygen is 3.5. And I know you guys can't see that, but you can look at the one in your book at home. When I take the difference between these two, I take the smaller from the larger, and that gives me a difference of 1.4. This again is in between my 0 0.4 and 1.7 range, which means that this is a polar bond. If I'm just looking at this bond in particular, out of context rather, then Oxygen has the bigger number. That means it's more electronegative. That means that all the electrons are wanting to hang out on oxygen and fewer are hanging out on the hydrogen. That means there's a slight extra negative charge over here and a slight positive charge over here. Now, if I put this bond back into context around my molecule, so I'm gonna drop my lone pairs, but we know that they're there. So here's my bent water molecule. And if I put this bond back into context, then it would be the same on both sides. This one would look like this, and this one would look like this. So I'd basically have a large concentration of electrons around my oxygen, and fewer around each of my hydrogens in general, right? So that means that I have this big bulb of electrons up here, making this side of the molecule slightly negative, and fewer over here, which makes this side of the molecule slightly positive. So now the whole molecule has one end that's negative, one end that's positive. That means that water is polar. Okay, so there's a combination then of the shape. So because this thing is bent, this is part of the reason that this does that, as well as the polar bonds that are in there. So let's look at another example. Let's take carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, when you put it all together in your Lewis dot structure, has carbon at the center with double bonded oxygens on each side, and we have our lone pairs. So everyone has a full octet, and this is the way that we go here. So I'm gonna put a bubble around my lone pairs just so that you can see that. 
Now carbon has two electron groups or two electron pairs around it as the central atom and two electron groups give you linear geometry. So the name of this thing is linear. That's the shape. And now I look at each of the individual bonds. If I look at this bond between carbon and oxygen and I go back to my Pauling electronegativity table, we've already seen that oxygen is 3.5 so carbon here, when I look at the top, is 2.5. When I take the difference between these two, I get 3.5 minus my 2.5, which gives me 1. This means that this is a polar bond. So if that was the only thing that mattered in determining polar molecules, then we would just say that it's polar. But wait! I'm going to draw this in a more schematic form here. So I'm taking away my lone pairs on my oxygens to give myself more room to draw the clouds. So oxygen is the more electronegative. If we're visualizing this as a cloud, that means that I'd have fewer electrons around my carbon and more around my oxygen. And then the same would be true on the other side. I'd have fewer on my carbon, more on my oxygen. So when I'm looking at the cloud here, I have a slight negative charge over here and a slight negative charge over here. Right? Extra electrons over here makes it slightly negative. Extra electrons over here makes it slightly negative. Now this molecule does not have one end that's positive and one end that's negative. It's both negative ends, which means this is a nonpolar molecule. So even though it has polar bonds, because of the shape of the molecule, because the oxygens are on the outside, the overall molecule itself does not have that one charge as one side and one charge as the other side. So CO2 is nonpolar. Now all of this to say, and this is a little bit of a review of Lewis dot structures as well as the Vesper structures. All of this to say, when you put together molecules that are polar, so polar with polar, then we have what is called a dipole, dipole attraction. And the dipole here, the term dipole refers to di meaning two, poles meaning ends basically. We can think about poles in terms of a battery, right? Like a battery has a positive end and a negative end, right? or two poles like the poles of the earth. So here's the earth and we have some poles and we have uh, land masses of some sort. Yeah, that's pretty good there. There's Europe, mm -hmm. Africa, Asia, that's pretty good there. Okay, so here's the earth and we have a north pole and a south pole, right? So we have north on one end, south on the other. And so we have two poles, we have a dipole on the earth as well. Okay, so the same thing with our molecule. Uh, two poles means that we have a positive end and a negative end. So if we put together two polar molecules, let's take our HCl here. We have our HCl, which again, if we're visualizing the cloud, is kind of heavier on one side. We have a slight negative end on this one, slight positive end on this one. I have another HCl because we're in solution and we have a bunch of things just kind of floating around. This one's the exact same configuration because it has the same bond. Then there's going to be a slight attraction between the slight negative side on one and the positive side on the other, right? Opposites attract. So this attractive force here is a dipole-dipole attraction. Okay, and it causes these molecules then to stick together. So they come together, they stick, they like to intermingle, right? Because of these opposite charges attracting, dipole, dipole. Now there's a specific type of dipole, dipole that is called hydrogen bonding. And it's going to especially be important when we start talking about water in more detail. So let's use water as an example. We said that water is polar and that it has this kind of cloud that would look like this with kind of the fat head on the oxygen. So we have a slight negative side, a slight positive side. If we bring another water molecule in, 
with a slight positive side, slight negative side, then there's gonna be an attraction between the hydrogen side of one and the oxygen side of the other, and that's gonna cause a dipole-dipole attraction. These are both polar molecules, but it's got something specific going on. So hydrogen bonding is a specific type of dipole-dipole. And the way that it works is that you have, hence the name, a partially positive hydrogen on one molecule that's attracted to a partially negative either oxygen, fluorine, or nitrogen on a second molecule. So the oxygen has to be in a polar bond, the hydrogen has to be in a polar bond. We're on two separate molecules. This allows for hydrogen bonding to occur, okay? The fluorine has to be in a polar bond on one molecule, the hydrogen on another. Hydrogen bonding can occur there. Hydrogen bonding can also occur with a partially negative nitrogen. So oxygen, fluorine, nitrogen are the only three elements that can hydrogen bond with a partially positive hydrogen on one. So this is a primary example of this. You have your hydrogen that's partially positive on one, attracted to an oxygen that's partially negative on another molecule. Okay, that's hydrogen bonding. In terms of strength, hydrogen bonding is very strong. This is a very strong attractive force. And it allows for some really unique characteristics of water, which we'll get into in the next chapter. Okay. Now dipole dipoles are somewhere in the middle in terms of strength. Hydrogen bonding is stronger than just dipole dipole on its own. But the weakest of the intermolecular forces or the IMFs are called dispersion forces or London dispersion forces or Van der Waals forces. Of course, there's a million names for them, Van der Waals, okay? But your book talks about them as induced dipoles, okay? So the term induced means that we're doing something to either a molecule or anything that doesn't normally happen, right? We're making something happen that is not normally there, or that does not normally happen. So if you induce labor, for instance, you're inducing a woman to go into labor before she's ready to go into labor, right? Or maybe she's ready, but her body just hasn't started labor yet. So if we're inducing a dipole, that means that we're inducing this separation of charges where there isn't normally a step separation of charges. So we know that dipoles are on polar molecules. Now nonpolar molecules don't have this uh, positively charged on one side, negatively charged on the other side. They just either don't have polar bonds Because if every bond in a molecule is nonpolar, that means that everyone is equally sharing things. So there are no dipoles. Or the dipoles, because of the shape, like in carbon dioxide, kind of cancel each other out. We don't have one side that's negative and one side that's positive. All of the sides are negative, or all of the sides are positive. So these dispersion or London dispersion or induced dipoles or Van der Waals forces, all of these are caused by the random motion of electrons. OK, 
Kinetic molecular theory says that electrons are always in motion. They're always moving around. And at any given time, an electron can be in a particular spot on an atom or molecule. So that means that if we have an atom of argon, say, argon is one of our noble gases, then here's our electron cloud. Right, we're visualizing all of the electrons around argon. We know that they're at different energy levels, they're in different orbitals, right? But if we're just kind of visualizing as a, it as a cloud, then these electrons at any given time could kind of be clustered on one side and then some of the others are spread out. But maybe just because of random motion, we have more on one side than the other. And if we have a cluster of electrons over here, then that's a place where we have a slight negative charge. Okay, and that means that we have fewer where there normally would be electrons, which leads to a slight positive charge. So just because of the random movement of electrons, we have all of a sudden these slight charges. And I might have another argon that's doing the same thing, where I have a spot on the cloud that there are fewer electrons, and then a spot where there are more. And so maybe there's one here, and a slight charge here. And there's gonna be some stickiness and briefly, while these electrons are in the positions that there are, they are, there's gonna be this stickiness between these particular atoms, okay? So this is really quick, this is brief. It's not long lasting, right? It's an induced dipole where there isn't a dipole. And this is just in individual atoms. Let's take carbon dioxide, for instance, or maybe something like, let's do chlorine, diatomic chlorine. Chlorine likes to exist as pairs, and so chlorine is nonpolar. Normally, chlorine would have an even distribution of electrons, right? So I have roughly the same number of electrons on each side at any given point. But because of random motion of electrons, then now I end up with maybe one side of the molecule that has more of the electrons than others. And again, this isn't a permanent thing, it's just random. So it's quick, it's an induced dipole. It's a dipole where there wasn't originally a dipole. But now I have a slight positive charge on here because I have fewer electrons and a slight negative charge over here because I have more. And if this thing butts up against another one of these chlorines, then this slight positive charge is going to attract some of the electrons from the cloud out this way a little bit. So this molecule is gonna induce a dipole into this one. And now I have a slight negative charge here and a slight positive charge here, and there's gonna be attraction. And then I have another chlorine over here. And this one is gonna cause some attraction here between the cloud and this partially positive charge. So now I have a slight negative here, slight positive here, right? So this one induced a dipole in this one, this one induced a dipole in this one, and it kind of acts like a chain reaction. A chain reaction of stickiness, if you will. And each one causes this deformation of the electron cloud or to, for these electrons to move in a less random way. And that less random way gives them a slight charge where there was no charge, an induced dipole. So this induced dipole can interact with other induced dipoles or it could interact with a polar molecule, for instance. So now this molecule would be attracted to a water molecule as well if one came in, okay. So these are intermolecular forces. So let's just kind of summarize here. So the three types were dipole, dipole. I don't know if you can hear, but my cat is racing around my apartment right now. Thanks, Rhapsody. Okay, dipole, dipole, which is between polar molecules. Polar with polar. And the second was our hydrogen bonding, which I'm just gonna abbreviate H bonding, hydrogen bonding, and that's a specific dipole-dipole. And it's just between our hydrogen bond on one molecule and either our oxygen, fluorine, or nitrogen on another. 
And then our third type was this dispersion kind of force, the induced dipole. And your book breaks it out between induced dipole, induced dipole, and induced dipole, dipole. Um, I think that's a little bit over the top. So we can kind of summarize induced dipoles as dipoles where there weren't dipoles before and how they interact once they have a dipole, whether it's brief or non-lasting or an actual physical dipole because of a polar molecule, it doesn't really matter. The behavior is going to be the same. Okay, so these are the three types of intermolecular forces, IMFs, and they allow for mixing to occur. And the way that they allow mixing to occur is because of the golden rule of solubility. So the golden rule of solubility is that like dissolves like. Remember that solubility is the measure of how well one thing dissolves in another. And so the golden rule for that is that like dissolves like. And when we're talking about likes here, in kind of quotation marks, like, then we're talking about polar things like to dissolve polar things and nonpolar things like to dissolve nonpolar things. So when we're mixing things together, things that have similar intermolecular forces, or IMFs, like to dissolve each other, okay? So the, if we can also think about these likes and likes as IMFs. Okay, so polar molecules will have dipole-dipole attractions to each other. So these dipole-dipole attractions could be with other molecules or within a sample of themselves. Nonpolar have induced dipoles, and so these induced dipoles will be attracted to the induced dipoles and other nonpolars. Okay, so like dissolves like. And we can try to determine how soluble something will be by asking the question, does it dissolve in water? does it dissolve in water? So when we're asking, does it dissolve in water? What we're really asking is, is it polar? And we determine polarity like we did at the beginning of the video. We have to look at our Pauline electronegativity values. We have to compare the values from our Pauline electronegativity chart. And if the difference is between 0.4 and 1.7, then it is polar. And if it has polar bonds and the shape is correct, then it will dissolve in water. Okay, so thinking about the shape and the polarity of the bonds is gonna give you this information. So from the Vesper structures, valence shell electron pair repulsion and the electronegativities. Okay, so that kind of gets us to um, to how we determine whether or not things will mix together. And because like dissolves like, if we look at the different IMFs that are involved, if we look at the shape of the molecule and the electronegativity, what the bonding looks like, then we can figure out whether or not these things will form a solution, whether one will be a good solute into that particular solvent. Okay, and that's it for now.